All right, part nine. We are down the home stretch. Uh, so we're talking about evolution. Last time we talked about the origin of life. Um, so evolution is expanding upon that, how we get to the ideas of the origin of life. So uh, if we look at fossils, fossils show us how long ago or what lived in a long dead organism. Uh, the, most of these are going to be extinct organisms. You can still find fossils or castings, molds of current species that are alive, but the deeper you go, the uh, idea is that you'll find more fossils from longer ago. So if we look at fossils based on the law of superposition, that states that the layers of sediment are deposited upon one, one another and a area that, that is found is a certain amount of millions of years ago or a certain amount of hundreds of thousands of years ago, or billions of years ago, depending on where you find it in the sediment. So, of course, the lowest layers are going to be the oldest. Uh, that's a relative age based on the strata of the position. Absolute age is radiocarbon dating. So radiocarbon dating, of course, uh, we talked a little bit about this when we did earth science. So radiocarbon dating is going to be the half-life of a specific carbon. And if you get that half-life, it can tell you how long that specific fossil has been there. Uh, so we have several theories of evolution, how these organisms went from what they were to what we are today. Uh, Lamarck's explanation believes that all species came from a common ancestor. Uh, he didn't really have proof, but he believed that species would change over time by acquired traits. So anything just happenstance would, would acquire this trait. It would learn it from something else uh, or acquire it in some specific way. This was disproven, uh, but for the time being, it was his best explanation. <clears throat> What we believe in now is the law of natural selection. So species that are more suited for the environment will produce more over many generations of individuals and increase that population over those who reproduce less. So think about if you have a white mouse. A white mouse in a wintry area would do very well because it blends in with the snow. So a white mouse would outsurvive a black mouse in, say, the tundras of Antarctica. Uh, but a white mouse may not be able to survive in an area of a lot of green vegetation because it's going to stick out. So it will, may, will probably be replaced over time based on what you see happening on whatever blends in the best. So these different traits are going to cause these species to overcome obstacles that others cannot. So whether that be camouflage, whether that be a faster predator to catch faster prey, or a larger predator that can, that can kill more larger prey, those are going to be traits that allow different species to evolve or go past the, those that they're competing with. Uh, Charles Darwin is credited with this, even though Alfred Wallace came up with the exact same idea. So the voyage of the Beagle is what we call an epiphany moment in science. So after leaving England, Darwin is going with the Beagle to try to find, uh, to look at the different species on the Galapagos. Uh, he reads a book by Charles Lyell that's called The Principles of Geology. In this book, there is the theory of uniform territorialism, which means that it states that a ge the ge geological process work today as they did in the past and observable. But it's talking about how it takes extreme lengths of time for this to for geology to repeat itself. And so thinking about this, Darwin processes that if it takes millions of years for these geological processes to happen, maybe it takes millions of years for species to change over time too. Because think about it, just because a falcon is a little bit faster than its cousin, that doesn't mean that its 
offspring will immediately be as fast as it and continue. It takes year after year after year for and generation after generation for these to survive and these traits to be passed on. So for instance, if you look at human beings today, we're way taller now than we were in the early 1900s or especially during the Civil War. You see much taller, larger people. That is a trait that's passed on based on what we see as attractable traits. Uh, so the Darwin's famous book, Origins of Species, by means of natural selection, contains this theory. So especially based on what he saw while he was on his voyage of the Beagle. So when he goes to his Galapagos Islands, or not his, but when he goes to the Galapagos Islands, he sees that this there is a large variance of these different finches, so these different birds. Uh, across different islands, different ones adapted to their specific area of food source. And because of that, they each thrive well in their area and do not do well in a different area. And just think about that. It's just it's just a couple of islands, but yet there's all these different types of finches, these different types of the same bird. So he sees that and thinks, and this must be what proves my idea of natural selection. So uh, descent with modification is one way. So Darwin suggested that all species on the planet came from a few original species. Uh, so as they mo modified, they would modify to their area. So if these finches were able, they're all the same type of finches, but they're all different based on where they are on the Galapagos, makes sense that that would be true amongst what happens gradually over these billions of years. Everything's going to come from some, uh, some original species. They're just going to adapt to their area. So modification of natural selection says that the environment limits the number of particular species that of the population will be. So it, the environment determines what these species are going to be, determines on what traits they have. Just like we talked about with our mice earlier. White mouse is going to do well in the snowy area. It's going to do terrible in a wooded area. So traits that increase the reproductive success of an organism, of course, they're going to be passed on. So if a black mouse in, the, in a field is going to survive better than a white mouse, of course, there's going to be more black mice to reproduce with each other. You're not going to have that white mouse, and gradually that's going to be weeded out and the white mice aren't going to live very long. They're going to be eaten a lot faster than these black mice. So original organisms adapt to their environment as their proportion of favorable traits increase. So as they get more adapted to their environment, they're going to live longer. That doesn't mean that they're going to, every single one of them will be successful. That's what natural selection is. Only the strong survive. Uh, fitness term is used to describe a single individual's genetic contribution to a population. So good fitness means it's going to be very well adapted. So a, the ability to camouflage with your environment is going to be very well adapted and going to, it's probably going to be passed on to your offspring because you're going to be able to camouflage. So you will mate with a female or a male that also camouflages. And by doing that, if you look at Gregor Mendel, you see that your traits that are dominant are going to be pushed through. And so the more dominant traits that are good for the environment, the longer you're going to survive. So here's our evidence of evolution. Homologous and analogous structures. So homologous are similar features that originated from a shared ancestor. Analogous means that they have identical functions and somewhat alike. A vestigial structure is a structure that is useful for ancestry species, but not useful for modern species. So this makes sense for something in the past, but not current. Uh, similarities, so your similarities in embryos are going to be extremely similar to each other. So coevolution is the change in two or more species in close association with another. So predators and prey will co-evolve in order to survive. 
Same thing with a parasite and a host. Conversion evolutions. This is the results when very different species start to evolve similarly. So look at a porpoise or a dolphin and a shark. They look very close together. They are not the same at all. One is a mammal, one is a fish, but the combination of their evolution makes them look very similar and attack very similar and feed very similar. Uh, divergent evolution is when two or more similar species become more and more dislike. So look at dogs. We took the gray wolf and we've turned it into hundreds of species of dogs in very short amount of time. Uh, it's very interesting to see how a how human interaction can cause divergent evolution very strongly. Uh, adapted ra radiation. Uh, many species relate to, or many related species evolve from a single an ancestral type, just like the finches we were talking about with uh, Darwin. So in the next, in your last part, we're going to talk about populations. Uh, we've talked about populations a little bit today, talking about how they work, how they depend on the environment, and then the traits that need to be pushed to go past the struggles in the environment. So uh, artificial selection, just like we like we said with the dogs, the process of divergence sped up, meaning that we have dogs evolving so much faster than they than they would have it, given a natural environment. Uh, population genetics, this is the study of evolution based on the genetic point of view. Usually results are in a bell curve, so you'll, you'll see how when we get to a certain point, there'll be a lot of genetic evolution, and then gradually it, it will uh, curve off. So we have different explosions of and different time periods in history are in past history, uh, e extreme history times times ago. So the eras that we talk about are when we have our population genetics that blow up. Uh, causes of variation are heredity uh, and environment. So a gene pool is where you put all the population together and if it's not for, if they are not, if they are unable to evolve and adapt to their environment, they will not succeed. So that is what the combination of environment and your parents are what gives us the variation in our population. So the Hardy Weinberg or Weinberg genetic equilibrium. This says that an allele, allele of frequencies tend to remain the same over generations and less acted upon by outside influences. These outside influences are environment and not genetics, not your heredity. Uh, so based on the following assumptions, there's no net mu mutations occur, occur. Individuals neither enter or leave the population. Uh, population is large, so that means they will mate randomly. You will have a large population like if you have a city of people to potentially mate and marry and live with for the rest of your life, there is a large assumption that you will not have a large change. Now, if it's a smaller area, say like a town of 600, that is going to change the potential suitors that you have. Uh, selection does not occur as well. So that, that's your last assumption. So based on all these assumptions, a large population is going to give us many different individuals to mate with, meaning that you do not have a specific mating influence. And so nothing will really occur as long as no mut mutations occur. So mutation uh, is allele frequencies may, must not change due to mutations. This is what we're talking about for equilibrium. Remember, we talked about homeostasis, equilibrium, same thing. Uh, these occur often very slowly, normally. Uh, however, if exposed to a mutagen, they will occur faster. So like toxic chemicals or radiation, mutations occur much faster. Uh, migration, populations must remain constant. If they migrate, 
they will have a chance to change. So if they, if organisms do not move into it, if it's just immigration or move out of the population, it should keep equilibrium. Large populations, uh, if you have a small, like I said, small populations will create uh, a better chance for mutation or for a larger chance of keeping those dominant traits going. Uh, random mating species do not, many species do not mate randomly. Uh, many mate based on certain characteristics. So it's hard to have equilibrium if, unless you have all of these. So number five, natural selection. Genetic equilibrium cannot have no natural selection. So it is the single most significant force that disrupts genetic stability. And genetic stability is not necessarily good for the population. Equilibrium may, does not allow for evolution. It allows for staying the same. Uh, individuals with an average form of trait have, a high, have the highest fitness. So that is a stabilizing selection. Directional selection is individuals that have more extreme for it, this form of a trait have greater fitness than those who have an average trait. So the anteater tongue, the longer the tongue is, the better chance it is to have, have to mate with it. Uh, disruptive selection is when individuals have either extreme variation of a trait, have greater fitness than the average form of the trait. So white showed limpets are going to be this disrupted selector. Uh, sexual selection, this means something that has a particular trait that invites individuals that's not for survival, but it just looks pretty. So peacocks, male peacocks or male cardinals, the redder the coat, you're going to see more of a selection, sexual selection to where the, the female is going to be more attracted to those. And that's your different selectors that could cause a disruption to equilibrium. Uh, remember... The strongest survive, but sometimes the prettiest survive when it comes to sexual selection. Um, now, this is pretty basic. When you are finished with this, go ahead and take the quiz. Remember, we only have one more section left. All right. Good luck.